Well, good evening. Welcome back to Going to Ground. Uh, happy Sexagesima, uh, for that is the day. Uh, we need all the festivals we can get at the moment, so we're celebrating all of them. <laughs> Candle Mass. <laughs> Sexagesima is, uh, is the Sunday before the Sunday before Lent, which is wonderfully... Uh, Anglicans just... Th there are never enough festivals for Anglicans, uh, 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 and we... We, every few days there's another one and so not uh, it wasn't sufficient to have Quinquagesima which is next Sunday the 50th kind of I think it's a backwards working from Easter the 50th day before Easter effectively um, and uh, it was sort of roughly worked back to the, the previous preceding Sunday being uh, Sexagesima then Septuagesima before that um, isn't it fan fabulous that, that there are so many particular names for the different days of the year? Um, anyway, that's uh, that's what you can celebrate this evening if you need an excuse um, to uh, raise a glass. There it is for you. Um, it's getting colder and it might snow tonight. I'll be out tomorrow morning though and um, we'll film uh, from on the way. Uh, uh, but I thought I would... Uh, read to you, as is my want, my written piece for Sunday. And um, so settle back, friends. And uh, this is called The Consolation of England. A bit of a political one, this one. Candlemas. And the land awaits its consolation, Simeon-like. Unfurling woes roll out so regularly that Media feeds read like Koheleth, a psalmody of untethered lament. The temptation is to withdraw into immediacy, of course, and simply feel the incoming, as if sat in a gaming chair of perpetual reaction, spotting and batting away the next insurgent. When people cry for strategy, what they really mean is prophecy, strategy being inorganic, mechanistic, hardly adequate for the times. After all, how do you map a landscape that is constantly changing? Our present panic seeks good words from the future, where no one but God has been. But in an age that sniggers away divine possibility, the Lord is afforded the past tense alone. We shall, I suspect, come to regret being so confident of our own purposelessness. Behold, mourns the weary preacher of the book of Ecclesiastes. All is vanity and vexation of spirit. What characterises his world is a kind of dogged amnesia, collapsing past and future into a monotonous present. There is no remembrance of former things, he wrote famously. Neither shall there be any remembrance of things that are to come with those that shall come after. Like the rivers, he suggests, that run into the sea before their ascension and condensation start the cycle again. But what if repetition is not our destiny, and we inhabit instead an ecology that's radically open, with memories not only of the past, but with a future? What if our absent-minded land were a place of promise, and we'd simply forgotten? Prophecy turns to the origins of things in order to seek and sketch what is to come. So, after its overflow last week, I'm drawn to revisit Swallowhead Spring. Remember that? Uh, we visited it a few months ago near Avebury in Wiltshire, where the River Kennet rises and begins to drain down into the Thames. Having reflected lately on the imagined separation of countryside and city, it's settling to be linked with South London by a single veining network of water. Like many such sites around here, the signage indicates conflicting claims on this landscape. A Pagan Britain sticker has been slapped upon an anti-littering notice, and the trees are frilly with ribbons and dangling dream catchers, symbolising what I'm not quite sure. What is clear, however, is the enduring need to mark territories where meaning or identity has been found our arrow-hearted initials notched into the bark. Lovers and villagers 
would apparently come to Swallowhead Spring for Good Friday picnics before shinning up the then accessible Silbury Hill. When I last visited in October, it was just a dry basin with a slightly sludgy brook, but now I can hardly approach for the cataract. Back home, a bubble-wrapped book has arrived, being the proceedings of the 1941 Malvern Conference. I can show you it if you like. Uh, there is nothing, as I may have remarked before, quite like the arrival of a second-hand book by post in a in a brown paper package. Not doesn't have to be tied up with string. Uh, R.I.P. Christopher Plummer. Um, but a substantial second-hand volume is a joyous thing. Anyway, where am I? <laughs> I digress. The proceedings of the 1941 Malvern Conference. A source I'm exploring for clues to the current and future condition of the beleaguered English church. Under the shroud of total war, Archbishop William Temple gathered an eclectic range of prelates, poets and politicians to devise a route by which the church might offer a lead to society in the new world that would at some point emerge. It is immediately striking in its erudition and reach, addressing the fundamental concern that the true end of man had lately been obscured by the pursuit of wealth. It's a genuinely interesting volume. And again, just as a digression, there are chapters here by T.S. Eliot, Dorothy L. Sayers, uh, as well as academic uh, uh, theologians and lay people. It's a genuine, genuinely eclectic uh, group of, of sacred and secular writers and speakers and thinkers of the sort that it's quite hard to imagine being able to gather today. Not impossible, of course, um, but I'd, I'd love a repetition of a conference like that. Maybe we'll do one. Um, the purpose of work and education, therefore, needed recovering, but with personality, not product, at its heart. Progress was, however, almost derailed by a Christian socialist attack on private property, which T.S. Eliot, among other Conservative delegates, rebuffed. Hard, perhaps, to imagine the same debate stirring such feeling today, although any consideration of social justice surely must. As H.G. Wells once observed, from the earliest times, society was a mitigation of ownership, the mutual recognition that cooperation needed to override competitive possession if humanity was to flourish. The matter was finessed at Malvern in fine Anglican style with the following resolution. This is it. Uh, it's a traditional doctrine of Christendom that property is necessary to fulfil to fullness of personal life. All citizens should be enabled to hold such property as contributes to moral independence and spiritual freedom without impairing that of others. But where the rights of property conflict with the establishment of social justice or the general social welfare, those rights should be overridden, modified, or, if need be, abolished. This was synthesis, I think, not fudge, and helping, helpful in reaching a similar conclusion lately, while I was trying to locate my true north, politically speaking. The conservative in me tends towards continuity, local institutions, and the parable of the talents in its acknowledgement of unequal gift and yield. The radical in me abhors squandered privilege and the exploitation of the poor for personal gain. Naboth Vineyard may be the place in scripture, therefore, for me, and given that I'm firmly in favour of covenantal ownership, in which promise precedes profit, and either promise points to the common good or is weighed in the balance and found wanting. The conservative fallacy is to recycle the sins and sinecures of our forebears and call it tradition. The equivalent on the left is to be perpetually uprooting and call it liberty. Amid their own peculiar failings, the Christian has somehow both to belong and not belong, to possess all and yet nothing, in search of a home that is forever ahead. That's the door. God bless you as you go to ground.